All right, thanks everyone for having me. Thank you for spending the next 30 to 40 minutes with me. Welcome, my name is Bruno Borges. I work at Microsoft. And uh, if you were here for the past five minutes, you've heard everything that I said. If not, you can go check the recording later for all the long version of the introduction. Um, today, we're gonna talk about um, building Java runtimes with JLink. And uh, we're also gonna talk about Microsoft and the Java ecosystem in general. Because if you're not a Java developer, uh, maybe there are other better content for you. If you're interested in Java, thanks for being here. If you are a Java developer and you do not know that Microsoft is using Java or has a build of OpenJDK, well, this is the session for you. Thanks. So let's uh, let's go through the agenda quickly. So we're gonna talk about a quick overview of Microsoft and Java. We're gonna talk about uh, creating Java runtimes with JLink, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the Java modules, but not much because this is not a presentation about modules at all. <clears throat> so first things first, why Microsoft in Java? Why Microsoft cares about Java? Well, I'll tell you what, Microsoft depends on Java to run its business. Um, there are two major areas at Microsoft that are 100% Java. One is LinkedIn. LinkedIn's backend is entirely, or not to, to exaggerate, primarily Java, mainly Java. Hundreds of Java engineers work at LinkedIn, and LinkedIn deploys hundreds of thousands of uh, JVMs in production with thousands of microservices or services in general that are deployed uh, in production. So the amount of Java at LinkedIn is tremendous. And because of that, our group uh, works with LinkedIn and we help uh, uh, them get the most out of, the, uh, of Java uh, technologies. So um, another group that at Microsoft, if, if you're not familiar with, I mean, Minecraft is a game that was that is quite famous. It was a big hit, and it's, it's still a big hit for folks that play with it. Uh, Minecraft has millions of gamers in the world, and just for the Java edition, Minecraft has several editions. The Minecraft Java edition has over five million uh, gamers. And the Java edition is very famous and very uh, engaging with the community of gamers because uh, there are different ways to do uh, mods and customize and play with it with your friends, and the community loves that. So Minecraft Java Edition uh, continues to, to amaze uh, gamers and also Java developers who like to play with it. So Microsoft and Mojang have uh, uh, two things in, in Minecraft. One is the client, which is a, a, a Java desktop application. And that is the server, the, the Minecraft Java Edition server. Not only that, we also have Minecraft Realms, which is a Microsoft Mojang service for hosting Minecraft servers. And with Minecraft Realms, uh, you don't have to manage or own your own Minecraft server. You just let Minecraft Realms do that for you. Um, so, so Minecraft relies on Java entirely for these things. And uh, it's super important that we keep uh, uh, that very um, uh, very alive. So the feature of Java is important to us because the feature of Minecraft Java Edition and the future of LinkedIn and the, the future of uh, Yammer and Bing and SQL Server and Azure, they all depend on Java. We have lots of technologies behind the scenes that are based on Java or based on the JVM and the, the future of the platform is important for the future of, uh, of Microsoft. So there's that. That's why, that's why we care about Java, because our business depends on it. And not only that, our customers depend on it. So customers that choose Azure for their Java uh, workloads, they have Java workloads, and we want to have the best cloud for them. So again, Java is important for us and for our customers. Um, we did, uh, I did talk about Minecraft Java Edition. The interesting thing, Minecraft Java Edition, the latest version now ships with Java 16. Um, it's, um, I think thanks to Minecraft, we could say that Java 16 is one of the most used Java versions in the world now for over 5 million players. So 
Uh, we are working with Mojang to ship the latest version, the, the next version of Minecraft Java Edition with Java 17, which is the, the latest uh, LTS release. Uh, and that's, that's still work in progress, but what you can do is check out the latest uh, release candidate version of Minecraft Java Edition. Uh, I think it's on release candidate four, and you can uh, download that and, and try it out. There are some quite nice enhancements to it. Uh, some enhancements are effects to Java 17, especially performance-wise. So uh, be, um, you know, if, you are, if you play Minecraft, give it a try, because uh, it's, it's very well worth it, the upgrade. And that's also to say, hey, Java continues to improve. You know, the, the previous version of Minecraft was in Java 8. And then we jumped all the way to Java 16. We doubled the version. So if Minecraft can do it, you can also do it. So please give it a try and upgrade your systems or desktop applications or games if you uh, uh, want to see the, the, the benefits of that. Another piece of big news is uh, we uh, joined the Java community process uh, officially, formally uh, in, the, in the last few weeks. Um, this was uh, this has been a conversation that Microsoft has been having internally with different teams. Uh, we we thought, hey, how can we participate even more? We already collaborated with OpenJDK. We already collaborated with different open source projects, the Eclipse Foundation, the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation. What else can we do to really you know engage and and uh, have our voice heard? Um, and that's why we, we thought, hey, joining the community process, the Java community process or the GCP seems to be the, the next step. And uh, uh, we are very proud to say that, you know, we are part of this community now. We have several partners that are already in the JCP, like Red Hat, um, Oracle, Azul, and other companies. So uh, being part of that list, being part of that uh, community is super important for Microsoft. So uh, thanks, JCP, thanks, Oracle, and thanks the Java community for welcoming us to this standards body. So let's uh, talk briefly about Microsoft Build Open JDK. So we we built our own Open JDK for several reasons. Um, um, in the past, we we've seen uh, some of the uh, 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 concerns about software supply chain and uh, being able to support open source to our own needs and to our own customers. So we thought, hey, let's have our own Open JDK. So we can we can have that security, but also being able to collaborate with others. Uh, if we just consume other people's Open JDK, there's not much that we can collaborate. But once we start building it, the opportunities just open; they just happen, and and that's where we are today, collaborating with other companies in the Open JDK project, and being able to ship our binaries has been teaching us a lot about uh, about open JDK in general and about about the Java ecosystem in general. So so the last few years have been great for Microsoft to really uh, engage and participate. So we built uh, open JDK for Windows, Linux, and Mac. We built for ARM and Intel architecture, and we work with version 11 and up. We are not looking back. I mean, if, if you want a Java 8 binary, Please do work with existing vendors like Oracle, Azul, Red Hat, Bellsoft, SAP, and so many other great companies that ship Java 8 binaries, and including the Eclipse uh, Adopt Adoptium project, which Microsoft collaborates with and participates in the development. So, so we thought, hey, we already co collaborate with Adoptium. There's no need for us to ship a Java 8 binary. It's very safe, very stable. Let's collaborate through the Eclipse adoption. So if you do want a Java 8 binary where Microsoft has a say, uh, check out Eclipse Tamarine binaries. And that's where we do uh, some of our investments and collaborations. But if you want a binary that is truly put uh, out there by us, if you're looking at version 11 and 17 for LTS, we have Java 16, but uh, we are not looking into that version as an LTS release. <clears throat> So, so some people may say, oh, Microsoft is forking Java. Well, no, no, Microsoft is not forking Java. The same way that Azul is not forking Java, Red Hat is not forking Java, no one is forking Java here. What we all do is we build OpenJDK from the source and we ship binaries. So 
there are some guidelines and requirements so you can you can truly say hey this is a build up in jdk and we follow all of them including most importantly we pass the oracle tck test for java or the java compatibility kit on top of that we also run tasks with the eclipse adoptium aqa bit which is a task suite to uh, make extra tasks um, like open, build open source projects uh, make sure that some open project will work well it's a bunch of tasks that anybody can collaborate anybody can go there and uh, uh, provide more tasks if you like just join the Eclipse Adoption Aqua Bit project and do that. We um, we leverage Eclipse Adoption scripts. So our build open JDK is built pretty much the same way as Eclipse hammering binaries are built. Our team collaborates and contributes back. We upstream changes to those scripts to Eclipse Adoption. Um, and uh, we try to do that as much as possible. There are, of course, some things because our infrastructure is not exactly the same as the Eclipse Foundation's infrastructure. So we might have a few changes that are only applicable to us. But for anything that uh, can benefit Eclipse Adoption, we definitely upstream those changes. We do package JDK only. We do not provide a GRE or uh, um, uh, GRE headless or GRE Ds or GRE that we only ship the JDK as most uh, vendors are doing these days. Some vendors do choose to provide different packages with some different software that is bundled, for example, like JavaFX. So you can find some packages out there that have JavaFX uh, bundled together. That's great. But for us, we don't see that need. We don't see that demand for our customer base and our own internal use. So for that reason, we only ship the JDK. And, uh, uh, and the reason we have this presentation is because, well, some customers, even internally at Microsoft, they say, we, I want just, just want the Java runtime, give me the Java runtime. Well, that's where we're gonna get into this conversation uh, today. All right, a uh, few reminder, like why, what has Microsoft been doing with OpenJDK? Well, we, uh, we provided the port of OpenJDK for Windows on ARM. Now, the interesting thing about that contribution is that it enabled the contribution or the implementation of the port of OpenJDK for macOS on M1, which is also based on the um, um, ARM or X64 architecture. So Apple Silicon and ARM, they have very similar architecture. So that's why uh, when we did the port for Windows on ARM, it was a lot easy to do the port for uh, Mac OS later. So um, Microsoft and Azul and Oracle and Bellsoft, uh, we had uh, several contributions throughout these projects and Microsoft is very proud to uh, have collaborated with, with them. So, so thanks all these companies for your uh, work on this. And uh, I'll give a, a big shout out to uh, Monica back with Ludovic, Harry, and Bernard Foster, who are uh, uh, who are here at Microsoft and implemented uh, this back port to Windows on ARM. All right, here's a table of what we, what, what do we ship? So basically, all our architectures and uh, all kinds of packages, uh, Tar Zip, MSI, Linux packages. Uh, we are still not shipping Java 11 for Mac OS M1, Apple Silicon, but uh, we might see that in the near future. We also ship Docker images. So if you want JDK, just uh, in a Docker container, you can just do that. I personally advocate that you should use these images as convenience. If you truly care about uh, supply chain, if you truly care about uh, having full control of what you deploy in production, what I suggest to people and customers is build your own Docker images from uh, the ground up, choose the OS base image of your choice, and then start from there. But we do offer these images as convenience. We do have an implementation of uh, a better implementation of MD5 intrinsics in our JDK that has been open sourced and it is available already on Java 17 and up moving forward. If you do want this 
capability on an older version of Java. Uh, I think right now, currently, this capability is only available on our JDK 11. Uh, but if you are using MD5 and that is a bottleneck of your performance, that is definitely a good uh, alternative for you to enable this flag uh, with our JDK 11 or any JDK 17. And uh, hopefully in the future, this will be a default setting. And uh, yeah, that's we have a documentation, nice documentation that you can check out. We have some articles uh, to help you find uh, all the all the binaries and resources that we have, and we also have some uh, learning material to help you move past Java seven, Java eight, and really get into the modern world of Java eleven plus, where the magic happens, especially uh, garbage collectors and memory consumption and everything else with Java language features and syntax and so on. I mentioned this before, uh, we do support Java 8 on Azure and we do, our team does provide support for Eclipse adoption uh, for Azure customers. So uh, if you're on Azure and you have to use Java 8, by all means, use the Eclipse adoption uh, tamarind binaries for Java 8 on Azure and you have uh, face support. All right, so, um, Let's talk about JDK and Java runtime. So I'm gonna scroll over quickly about some of these slides, uh, how you how people install JDK these days. Um, most of these slides cover uh, Eclipse Adoption, Microsoft Developer JDK, and uh, other JDKs available in the market. So the best, in, in my opinion, the best way to install JDK is download a compressed file, either a zip file or a .gz, and just extract that configure your Java home, put that in your path environment variable, and you're good to go. Seriously, there's no need to go fancy. Of course, there are several ways, and you're gonna talk about them, but this is my view of the best way. And if you do need multiple JDKs installed, um, I do recommend that you learn a few script, shell scripting, uh, uh, shell scripting uh, magic and work with uh, aliases. So you, instead of running the command Java or Java C, you can run the command Java 6 or Java 7 or Java 8 or Java 11, and that alias points to the Java binary in the JDK of that uh, particular version. The JDK, maybe that doesn't work with 6 and 7, but certainly works with Java 8 and 11 and plus. So, uh, when you do that, the Java process will will find where it is installed itself and uh, 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 locate the JDK. So uh, you don't necessarily have to be updating Java Home all the time. All you need is uh, just uh, use the alias. But if you do, um, for some reason, some old scripts or legacy stuff, uh, yeah, just run some scripts and you update Java Home and you're good to go. Super uh, easy and simple. Um, and if you want to uninstall, just delete the folder. If you need to update, just extract the new version and port Java Home to that new version. Uh, minor update version or major update version, doesn't matter. It's really just a folder of the JDK. Works great. But if you do want to go fancy, we uh, see uh, MSI installers for Windows, uh, which also allow you to use Wingat if they are published on the Wingat. Wingat is a new tool for Windows. It's like a, it's like a Yammer, I'm sorry, a Homebrew or Yum or APT um, or SDK, uh, all these great package managers. Wingat is a Microsoft project for uh, package managers for Windows. So what you can do is install Wingat and then you can do it in your shell, just Wingat search, Wingat install, and you're good to go. Um, behind the scenes, it will install the same MSI package. Uh, but uh, with, with defaults and everything, so you, you may not even see the, the dialogue. If you double click on an MSI package, it's a regular MSI package. Some of them come with the option of setting the Java home environment variable for you, which is great, and add to the path, so also great. Some of them allow you to associate with a jar file, so when you double click on a jar file and it's like, let's say it's a Java application package at, as a jar file, it will run that automatically. So the JDK, uh, is a is a uh, uh, is installed and you can do uh, anything. Uh, sorry, well, okay. Uh, for 
uh, updating. Um, yeah, these are the ways that you can update. Uh, all Windows installers have that. You can you can just uh, install and uninstall through your control panel. The macOS installer also it's a DMG package. I'm sorry, a PKG uh, package, and uh, it comes with a GUI mode and a silent mode, easy to install. Um, if you want to uninstall, you can just move the application to uh, to the trash. If you if you want to prefer homebrew, we have packages available there. So again, easy. Easy peasy. For Linux, several options. I still prefer the Tor GZ. The thing that the thing that is nice about Linux packages is that they will help you manage some dependencies, some, some Linux dependencies. So for, let's say let's say you have a, a Linux server and you require in in uh, and your application uh, will have to deal with font because you're gonna do some image rendering on on your server, so you need some fonts. So for that, when you do install with uh, just by targz and you extract the package, the JDK will be available, but the Linux environment may not have the font for your image processing. But if you do install using these packages, Debian or RPM packages, most of the JDKs have the dependency on the font package, so you won't get a runtime error. The package will be uh, checked upon installation. So you you have that dependency cleared out. So that's why it's nice to use these packages. But if you know what you're doing, the Charge Z also works pretty well and you have all documented in your process. So your server will be properly configured and so on. But the RPM and Debian package are convenient to have those dependencies cleared out. And uh, for visual desktop applications, it will require the uh, 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 some libraries for, for GUI, uh, same, same thing. <clears throat> And finally, SDK Man. Um, I just put this slide, SDK Man, SDK Man. It's a great software. People should try it out. If you don't have SDK Man, please install. It's easy. It's great. You just do SDK search, SDK install, Java, and then which Java you want to install. Uh, I personally use a combination of SDK Man and uh, Jamv. It's, uh, Jamv is a utility to uh, easily switch between JDKs. Uh, there are different methods of doing that, but, uh, but um, I prefer that method. And SDK Man, just just Google for it, and uh, uh, it's it's a great solution to manage. Not only installs JDKs, but also installs CLIs for several uh, Java projects. So um, if you don't have it yet, just go and configure. Works great on Linux and Mac. For Windows, it's tricky. Uh, you have to uh, use Sigwin or Git Bash or WSL, things like that. Because uh, uh, SDK Man is not uh, Windows native per se. So it's not PowerShell compatible, for example. So you need a Linux-like environment on Windows to do that. All right, so we talked about JDK. What about the Java runtime? My application does not need a JDK. I don't care about the JDK. I don't care about the Java compiler. I don't care about the JAR tool. All I want is the Java runtime, the JVM, and the Java APS. That's it. Well, starting with Java 9, uh, things changed a little bit. So before we dig into uh, those changes and what is the state currently, it's important to understand why there was a JRE, a JRE or Java runtime environment in the past. And that's what I want, really want to talk about. <clears throat> so, oh, I got a message. Okay. So in the past, JREs existed with the, sole, with, with, with the primary function of being a Java runtime available in an operating system. So you could run Java uh, easily, especially through browsers. So the JRE primarily by some microsystems was to run Java applets in the browser <coughs> and Java web storage applications or Java apps ship as a jar file. So you just drop a jar file, which is like a 50 megabyte jar file or 10 megabyte jar file, it doesn't matter the size, but it's, it's a fat jar that has a full Java application inside, whether server or desktop, doesn't matter. But, but that was the idea. So anybody could go to the console and type, type Java or double click on a jar file and run the application 
or go to a website that has applet and run that applet. So that was the goal of the JRE, so that Java would be available anywhere, right? But that, but that changed these days. We don't have applet support anymore in the browsers. Java Web Store doesn't, is not supported anymore. Uh, fed jars are, there are better ways to ship Java applications uh, or any application to uh, developers. So you have PKG, DMG, you have uh, MSI, MSIX for Windows. Uh, you can ship uh, applications as uh, an Android application if you if you like. So uh, you should package your application for that particular uh, environment OS or Linux distribution. Uh, there's NAP for Ubuntu. So there are different application packaging formats, and that's what actually is better for end users instead of just shipping a jar file. Sure, it's it's great for us geeks, but for the end user, it may not be the best option. So. The, 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 the other challenge with GRE is, is you, you really cannot uh, uh, see or find a specification of what constitutes a GRE. Where is in the specification what a GRE should be or should look like? There's no definition. GRE was a product of some ecosystems and Oracle. And some, some companies that well, after Java got open source, they decided, well, I'm going to continue shipping a GRE as well. So that's why some JDK vendors, they also ship GREs. But in reality, JRE does not exist. What exists is the JDK. The JDK or open JDK, that, that's what exists. The JDK is, in practice, a Java runtime with development tools, with a compiler, with a packaging thing, with a debugger, things like that. So. JDK is on time with development tools. How do you get a GRE? Well, you delete the development tools. And that's what many JDK vendors have been doing for the past years. They would build open JDK from the source and then copy everything into a folder and remove uh, some command line tools and some other stuff. And oh, that's, that, there's my GRE. And that's very convenient. But there are a few challenges with that that don't help us developers or uh, uh, modernize Java applications for the benefit of end users and also operation teams on, on infrastructure. And here's why, here's how. For desktop apps, you ship your application with the Java runtime. That means that your end user doesn't have to install Java. They don't have to go to java.com or, oh my God, how do I configure this Java thing? I have to do my Java home and put in the path. No, the end user doesn't care about that in the same way that we don't care about Electron. Like, yeah, Microsoft Teams is uh, based on Electron. Slack is based on Electron. But who installs Electron? No one installs Electron. You install the app, the actual app. And the Electron is a runtime that ships with the app. So that's how Java applications should be also shipped. So maybe we can at least rest in peace with our moms complaining about Java. Oh, hey, my. Java on my computer is not working, and then we have to go there and fix that. But you know, the idea, the ideal world is our mom doesn't even know Java is used behind the scenes. It just works, and it's already there with the application. So for server-side applications, there are some gotchas, but this is like a general uh, view. Uh, it's just my opinion as well. Um, it 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 helps you eliminate the ops teams need to manage Java on your behalf. So you as a developer, you just ship to them a container. You just ship to them a package, RPM, DAP, and they just install and run. They don't care about uh, Java. It should be you that should care. It's very much like Go and Rust model. Go applications, Rust applications, the developers compile those things. They come with a runtime. They come with a garbage collector. They come with those things inside. And the ops team just run that thing. It, it's there, right? So that that is the main benefit, which allows you, developer, to be constantly updating Java for your own benefit of having access to the latest language features, better performance, and so on. The moment that you bring the responsibility of shipping a Java runtime with your app, you are removing some or eliminating someone else's responsibility of installing and maintaining Java. That is a true benefit here of, of shipping uh, a Java runtime with your, with your application. You know, even James Gosling says that. 
The JREs disappear with JDK9, use JLink to assemble exactly the JRE you need. Now that's when we got into a little bit more details. JLink is a new tool in the JDK that allows you to create a Java runtime or assemble, let's put this word, why assemble is better because assemble is just putting the pieces together. Creating would, look, would mean that something is being generated. Nothing is being generated when you use JLink. It just assembles a copy of the Java runtime that is in the JDK to a separate folder with only the pieces of the Java runtime that you need. For example, it removes all the development tools. It removes certain modules that you don't need. It removes certain files that you don't need. It assembles that Java runtime specifically for what your application will need. <clears throat> so when we, when we look at the Java module system, there are uh, several modules. Your application may not need and most likely will not need all of these modules. And people will say, well, I want to use the Java runtime uh, JRE because it's more secure than the JDK. I heard this argument before. Well, I'll tell you what, if you care about security, you shouldn't be using the JRE in the first place because JRE contains all of these modules. It contains um, um, all of these uh, JDK modules, internal modules, because the JRE that is produced today is not exactly the same JRE that used to be produced in the past. So, so if, 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 if developers care about security, they should really care about security and eliminate the things that their application do not need. So, so that's argument number one. Argument number two, people say, I want JRE because it's smaller than the JDK. Well, if you care about the size of the JRE of your Java runtime, then you should go with the smallest runtime possible. And the smallest runtime possible will be one created, or I'm sorry, assembled with JLink. With JLink, you can select only the pieces that you want, again, and that will ultimately give you a much smaller Java runtime than a general purpose Java runtime. And with that, you are saving storage size, you're saving bandwidth, and you're increasing security. So if people are using those two arguments, I say I give them those arguments back. So how do you create a Java runtime? Well, I'll give you two lessons for what? You can you use the JLink command and you select which modules you want. And then you tell where to uh, uh, assemble that Java runtime. In this case, here is uh, the output is slash JVM. Uh, how do you identify which modules your application needs? Well, that's a tricky part. That's an exercise for uh, 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 all of you to go check it out. It's, there's a command line in JDK called JDAPS. You run JDAPS against your fat jar or your project or whatever. There are plugins for Maven and Gradle, et cetera. It will scan your application, identify the modules. Okay, I got my JVM. How do I use that? Well, you, you set your Java home, or you just point Java minus jar to your application, and that's it. So in this slide, what you can see is a multi-stage build with Docker. So the first stage, I am building or assembling a Java runtime. So I use the Microsoft Beautiful Pin JDK, JDK image for 17 on an Ubuntu based image. That's my stage build phase. In that image, I create my Java runtime with only the modules that I need. On the second uh, stage of this multi stage build, you can see that I'm using a different base image. I'm using Debian. And here's why I'm using Debian because I want to use Debian. My company. Uh, does not like Ubuntu, but you know the Microsoft Beautiful BGDK is only available on an Ubuntu-based image. Well, you don't need to do that. You don't need to use Ubuntu. You can use Debian. You can use the copy dash dash from to copy the Java runtime that was assembled on that previous stage into your final image. So now you have full control of your image with a Java runtime that was assembled only for your application. And that is the best of all worlds. You get a small runtime, you get a secure runtime, you get a, in a Docker image that you control fully, and your application will run much better. 
So here's a here's an example of image size comparison of image size from based on different uh, settings. So uh, 17 JDK for Ubuntu, 450 megabytes. 11 JDK, 423. So a little bit bigger. But then we look at the JRE. There is an 11 JRE available out there that is 246 megabytes. And you can try to, to squeeze a little bit more and use a slim version of Debian. That will give you 199 megabytes, only 45 megabytes smaller. But then, but then it's a slim version of Debian. It may not be com fully compatible with everything that you might have. So maybe you have to roll back to a full Debian. But if you use JLink, you cut that by half. And that is including uh, um, quite a few modules. If you want to squeeze even more, then you go to Alpine. And then you have like the smallest possible image ever. But then it's Alpine, which is muzzle C library implementation, not glibc. And that also may have some gotchas. So you have to balance. Now, my point is you can go from 246 megabytes to 100 and 107 megabytes, like half the size, half the size with, with, like, with the full Java uh, uh, specification. And you can go even smaller if you want. Now, there are a few things that you should be aware. And I'm almost done here with my presentation. And, oh, and by the way, if you want to try some uh, demos, go to my GitHub, uh, github slash Bruno Borders slash demo dash JLink. And you can try these things on your own computer. Uh, some developers will uh, create a very small Java runtime, but they will find this very common error where they try to establish an HTTPS connection, which requires SSL, which requires cryptographic algorithms available in the JDK. Well, that's one of the issues that I've found that are quite tricky. And uh, unless you face this at least once in your life, you will not know and you're going to freak out what's going on. So. The JDK, the OpenJDK project has a, a default JCA, Java Cryptographic uh, Authority uh, Provider or API uh, provider. And it's called the Sun EC. And uh, it provides uh, algorithms of several uh, types. But that but those are only available in this module, jdk.crypto.ec. So you have to include this module, or else your Java runtime will not be able to uh, make uh, secure connections. So it's quite tricky. Either you have that module, which is the default implementation on OpenJDK project, or you have to provide your own implementation, your own JCA uh, provider. Uh, and there are a few out there that you can find on the internet. So in general, you will see error messages like this. Error occurred during the installation of the VM, uh, cannot find uh, 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 such file, and the module Java instrument may be missing from runtime image. So most often, you will get errors like this, which will indicate your Java runtime that you assembled uh, does require a module. Your application requires a module that is not available at runtime. Your application may compile, but at runtime, it may not work. So you got you to gotta be very careful when you run the JDAPS tool and uh, properly scan and test your application. So here's the thing, when you do a test, your integration test on your uh, CI CD, you should be testing against your Java runtime, not the JDK, if you are using JLink for your production environments. So watch out for that. If you want to learn more about Open JDK, Microsoft Build Open JDK, uh, here's our roadmap. We're gonna we are working on uh, an Alpine Linux uh, port for uh, Java um, 11. And we are working with the uh, Eclipse Foundation to have also a uh, backport of Eclipse Tamarin for, for Alpine Linux for Java 8. Um, we are targeting these dates. Hopefully, it happens before. If it does not, it will happen later. Very unlikely it will happen at the dates that will be scheduled, so as usual. So if you want to learn more or communicate with us, you can go to GitHub slash Microsoft slash OpenJDK. That's where we do most of our conversations through the issues tab or the discussions tab. Any feedback, thoughts, ideas, uh, we are more than welcome to uh, listen to. Uh, 